it's my honor and pleasure to introduce someone that most of you probably already know, um, Deb Nelson Gardell. If you haven't had the immense pleasure um, of having her in a class, um, or in a training, then you're in for a treat. She is amazing. Best presenter I've ever worked with. She's also my mentor and my friend. She's already um, got her degree. I'm not quite sure why she does. <laughs> 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 oh, she really it. At least I believe it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she is, I don't think she needs much more introduction than that. Um, She's going to present for you an overview of psychological first aid, not the full course, because you know we have time for that today. Six hours, so we're not doing that today. <laughs> and she's tired. About, who knows about psychological first aid already? Um, yeah. Who's done psychological first aid already? I used to do mental health first aid. But Might be the same thing. Yeah. If you were, if you were here for the tornado, the big one. How many were here for the tornado, the big one? We used this intervention after that tornado, and that's when I first learned about it. I trained again on this intervention actually in China. Um, about two summers ago, I did some training in the summertime in China for social work faculty there, and I basically, you're getting the adapted version of what I shared with them in China. This manual that you can go look at is available in Chinese because this is a very widespread, well-used, it's all over the world kind of intervention. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I did before coming to you today was look at the research, because I'm a researcher and that's what I do, I look at the research. Um, the other day I found a, a quote that's from Harry Potter. Anybody in here Harry Potter? Yeah, <laughs> so apparently, um, Ron one day said of Hermione, that's just what she does. When in doubt, go to the library. That's my life's philosophy. When in doubt, go to the library. So I went to the library. And there was a study in 2010. Children as bellwethers of recovery, dysfunctional systems, and the effects of parents, households, and neighborhoods on serious emotional disturbance in children after Hurricane Katrina. So this intervention is not necessarily child-focused. And I started thinking, why am I doing this at a child conference? It's not necessarily child-focused. But this research convinced me that this is an intervention that every mental health professional needs to know about. And actually, it does. you don't need to be a mental health professional in order to deliver this. When I tell you about it, you're going to see that it's pretty much something I mean, some of the stuff like triaging for pre-existing mental health disorders, you need a professional for that, right? Because somebody who's been trained and all of that stuff. But generally speaking, this intervention is pretty easy to deliver and it relies on the natural proclivities of humans after they are through a disaster. So the notion of this article is that if we don't intervene in the environment post-disaster or post-trauma and we don't take care of everyone, parents, community, teachers, children are the ones that show the negative effects first. If there's trouble, if they haven't had a supportive environment, they're the ones who are kind of like the canaries in the mine shaft, if you all remember that kind of metaphor. They show the negative effects first. So I think this is worth your time. And I'm going to go over it today. I got two. you saw how big that handout was. We're talking about one slide it's a minute, right? We're just going to fly through this. And if I'm done early, are y'all going to be mad at me? No. You can go look at the eagle's wings table and buy something for yourself or your spouse or your grandmother or whomever you would like to buy it for. So I wanted you to know a little bit about that, that research about kids and how they show up first. Now, if you were here for the tornado or been through any kind of disaster, this look, should look familiar to you, right? This is, this is what it looks like. Pre-disaster, there's the threat, the warning, but we're kind of, kind of immune to those now, aren't we, when there's going to be a natural disaster. They come so often. How many times do you hear the um, tornado watch and you're like, eh, yeah, I'm going to the grocery store. Well, you can't do that because all the milk and bread is gone. <laughs> but you could go to the park or whatever you're going to do, right? 
but you get ready, you know what you're supposed to do, you get the bread and milk, you go home. Then there's the event. And right after the event, we see amazing things. And this is the honeymoon part. This is the part that um, I think Valerie Trull, one of the organizers of this conference, she's in the other room right now, I heard her say last week, this is my favorite part. When the community comes together and everybody helps everybody else, and in our neighborhood after the tornado, neighbors came out who never talked to one another, and they chopped up trees together, and then after the trees were chopped up and everything was good, we went back in our houses. Right? That's the honeymoon phase, but it goes away. It doesn't last. And then there's disillusionment that happens because all of a sudden the support's not there and the need still exists. People lost their homes. If you've driven through Alberta, finally now we're starting to see some building, right, or more building. Uh, many of the people who lived in that area have gone because there was no building for a very long time. So they basically got disillusioned but they bounced back and we all bounced back and we came to terms, right? And we have a new beginning. The city now looks amazing, right? All this new construction. We've got stack of student buildings everywhere you look, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You've seen them. They're at least four stories tall. Um, the other thing that happens, however, is trigger events and anniversary reactions. Um, we memorialize each year on this campus the students who died in that particular event. Um, I don't know about you, my house was pretty close to where the tornado came through, so whenever there is now a warning, like, like there's a tornado coming, I can feel the, the traumatic symptoms. I, I, can, I can notice them and know what they are. Um, because I remember what the tornado looked like as it was coming towards the house because James Spann had it on my very large television. Um, and then the le television went off and then I heard the tornado, right? Those, those images are very, those are trigger events for me and probably for some of the others of you and there's anniversary reactions associated with that. So survivors, after they survive, man, my husband and I, when that tornado went the other way, we were like, oh my, we thought we were gonna die for sure, right? But then we didn't, because we did hear that tornado. We were elated, the whole community was like, we made it through, you're feeling sad, but you're also feeling pretty elated, you're happy to be alive. The reality of the disaster hits home. I remember leaving my neighborhood finally after about a week to drive through Alberta, and it was, the feeling of seeing the flat, of seeing no houses, the trees ripped, right? You know, we still have a few of those. You see the tops of them, they're just kind of like, like ripped from the top. Loss and grief become very prominent. Okay, this is the point. In those few, first few days, that first week, that first two weeks, and actually the first three weeks, um, I was at Temporary Emergency Services doing some of my volunteer work. Any of, the, uh, any of you doing any volunteer work during that time? You remember what it was like, right? There's some people who are going to look like they have mental health troubles, but it's, you remember the slide that Funda showed this morning of the mental health diagnoses with the trauma symptoms? So it's hard sometimes to differentiate what's going on. But a trained professional can do a history and can figure out how much of this is from the disaster last week and how much of this was going on before the disaster last week. So there does need to be a little bit of triage to figure out who needs what kind of services and a professional does need to be, I think, involved with that. Psychological first aid is an evidence-informed, oh, don't you hate when, you, I, maybe this doesn't, typos grow in my presentations. <laughs> I swear, I've used this, and I saw this typo for the first time. It's an evidence-informed, not an evidence-formed, an evidence-informed modular approach to help in the immediate aftermath of a disaster or terrorism. It's designed to reduce initial distress. That's the whole point of this, um, is, to, is to help people get back on even keel right after they've been thrown off kilter. Um, it's, 
known because we do that. We have some research. We don't have a ton of research, but we have some research. It's designed to foster both short-term and long-term coping and adaptive functioning. So the, the interventions, the components of it, are intended to help people kind of stabilize right now, right afterwards. But then, because you've stabilized them right after and helped them pull into action their coping mechanisms, also helps in the long term. So there's some online resources, and I'm sharing this with you because there's contact hours who's licensed in here. Always looking for contact hours, right? There's contact hours associated with some of this stuff. So you can go online and do some of this training. <coughs> Here's one of the websites. You can see the different components, the modulars, the modules. You have in front of you the one page handout is kind of like an overview or a summary of the components. The reason I thought I wanted to give you this much material was because I really think it would be good for our community if you got the training before the next tornado hit, right? I mean, I did this training like in the context of that tornado hit and I was trying to get the training so I could deliver the intervention effectively at the same time as recovering myself. That doesn't turn out to be a good plan. Um, it's, I'm hoping that you all, when you leave this, this, this um, presentation today, maybe next week you'll go, oh, I need some contact hours. That woman at the thing told me about this. And you'll go look, right? And you'll go do the training so that when we have a disaster in this area, because it's not if, this is a tornado prone area. There's other weather events that can happen. Our world is a precarious place. One never knows what, what, what can happen at any time. Get yourselves ready now. And so I'm introducing this to you in this way with that hope that you're going to go away and do this training yourself. So this is one place that you can do it. But the other place is the, what we've already been talking about, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is the, uh, the organization that FUND is an external um, affiliate of. Um, they've got a training, psychological first aid online, so it's not like you have to go anywhere and it will, you'll sign in, you can come back to it, you don't have to finish it all at once. Um, and it, I think this is, you can see it's got six CE credits available from these various professional organizations. So two online resources for you to do this training. And maybe this PowerPoint today will whet your appetite a little bit and make you think, oh, maybe this is doable and I should go do this. If you're, who, who in here is a mental health professional? So all of you, this training is like, you need to do it simply because you're supposed, there's, there's like a certain way to do this stuff. And in order to, to be in line with the way you're supposed to do it, but this is going to use the skills you already have. This is not, this is not like a new skill that you're going to go, oh my god, I learned how to do like EMDR or something. Um, how many of you are EMDR people? Anybody? Well, when you learn EMDR, it really is quite different, right Barry? He and I got trained together. It's quite different than, um, than our typical kinds of skills. This is not, this is calling on, this puts your skills, your pre-existing skills together in a certain configuration. Okay, empirical evidence suggests that the prevalence of PTSD among direct victims of disasters is 30 to 40%. Now, be clear about, we're not talking about post-traumatic symptoms right after. In order to get a PTSD diagnosis, this has to be at least six months later. Okay, so we're not talking right, everybody right after a disaster has some level of post-traumatic stress. And because we're humans, we're used to dealing with trauma, we have natural ways of, of dealing with it, and we come back to homeostasis, but some don't. And after a, national, a, a, a natural disaster, this is the research that's um, victims of disasters, 30 to 40 percent. Among rescue workers, 10 to 20 percent. The prevalence in the general population, 5 to 10 percent. So the kind of, that tornado was a big deal here. It, it, it definitely affected, even though, you know, I've, I've been around it. People are like, no, I'm strong. 
I go through that stuff all the time, doesn't bother me. I hear that a lot. I don't believe it because this stuff does affect people and if you don't pay attention to it, if you don't respond to it, then the effects linger and they affect later functioning. You heard about the ACEs study this morning. Those, those traumas, those, they have health effects. There's long-term health effects if you don't address trauma. If you address it, you're managing it. You're, you're decreasing. That cortisol causes inflammation in your body. That's one of the reasons why there's so many long-term health effects is the, the, the exudation of cortisol over, the, over a long period of time. But if you address it, you can minimize those effects. We don't know, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm a researcher, I could come out here and say, yeah, psychological first, we know it works, go do it, but I'm gonna be, an, I'm an honest researcher. Do we know if, if psychological first aid decreases PTSD? No, we don't know, the research hasn't been done. I don't know if any of you, um, who's a researcher in here besides me and um, Bert you? No, so research is really expensive. It's really time consuming, it's very complicated um, it's hard to do, so we would love to have research on everything, to know that everything had this evidence for support, but this kind of intervention is hard to do research on because usually it's only used post-disaster, not, wow. So, and if you've ever heard of the institutional review boards, that's the, the, the people on a campus who tell professors, yes, you have permission to do the research and here's how you protect. The IRB was not operating during the post-disaster here. Right? So doing that kind of research post-disaster is hard. Some people from outside do. That's why you have the stuff from Katrina. Those were, a lot of those academics were from outside of the, of the, of the disaster area. We don't know if it's gonna, if PFA will decrease PTSD or not. I believe, based on my gut and working in this field for a really long time, I believe it does. But again, I, that's, a, that's an opinion based on kind of just experience and knowing what, what people do. Um, we do have this, um, I report to you here, 2012. Scientific evidence is lacking, but it's widely supported by expert opinion and rational conjecture. In other words, people have looked at these components and they understand what trauma does and they understand the trauma effects and they've said, yeah, based on what we know, this is something that should work. It's designed for delivery by mental health and other disaster response workers within a wide variety of, of places. So we used it at temporary emergency services. It was being used in the churches around the city um, where people were going for disaster relief. Um, it was used by the mental health care providers. It was used in the shelter. So it can be delivered in lots of different places under lots of different circumstances because it doesn't require a whole lot of fancy equipment. I remember afterwards, you know, I'm a social worker, so I'm used to paperwork, right? So afterwards, I'm like, what do you mean? Shouldn't I be filling out paperwork? Isn't there paperwork I'm supposed to be <laughs> Well, you know, they had us kind of keep track of who we were seeing and, and, you know, what we did, and there wasn't a whole lot going on. And this, this is the kind of intervention where you don't need that kind of intense documentation. Um, first responder teams, healthcare providers, school crisis response teams, social workers from the local university, um, all kind nurses, psychologists, licensed professional counselors. Um, there's lots of different people who are able to provide this kind of intervention. It is consistent with research evidence. So even though we may not have those randomized controlled trials that say, um, you know, we know people who didn't get this, didn't get better, and people who did get this, did get better. Even though we don't have that kind of research, it's consistent with other research, right? So it's, cons it's, it's built on research, even though it hasn't been researched itself very thoroughly yet. It's applicable and practical in field settings, and that's why people are using it, because it's easy to use. You can get an app. Like seriously, you can download an app for psychological first aid. So if you forget what you're doing in the field, you can just pull out your handy dandy app and look and see what you're supposed to do next. It can be used across the developmental 
um, lifespan, so it's, it's useful with kids, and if you do the six hour training, it will give you special ideas on how to do it with kids, it'll give you special ideas on how to do it with people with disabilities, it'll give you special ideas on how to work with people who are older, it's applicable across the lifespan and across differing abilities. It's culturally informed and it's delivered in a flexible manner. So here's one of the things, sometimes when I've worked with um, mental health professionals in the past, they're often resistant to evidence-informed interventions because they have this idea that there's a book and you gotta follow the book or you're not doing it right. This is an intervention where that's not necessarily true. It's, you can deliver it in a flexible kind of way and so you don't have to worry about not doing it according to the book. It's components based and you can just deliver what's needed in under the circumstances and so on. I see a nod back there. If that's a, you, are you someone who? No, I'm just agreeing with yeah, you. Yeah, I know. I know for a long time I was like, that TFCBT, I'm not going to do that. It's too inflexible. But then I went and got the training. Turns out it's not. It's pretty robust and you can deliver it in the same way in a pretty flexible kind of way. Anyone who's exposed, who is it for? Anyone. It can be first responders, children and adolescents, parents and caretakers, families, adults, other disaster relief workers, anyone who's in an area who was affected by the disaster either directly or indirectly. Um, you all, I'm confident, have heard the word vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress, right? This is an intervention that is also useful post-disaster for even vicarious trauma or secondary trauma. What time did I say we should come back? Y'all heard me talk in there. We're, we're coming back at 3.15. Yeah. So I've got still a long time, right? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Because what slide am I on? are we on? I'm, I'm like, I might be talking too fast. I'm <laughs> good. All right, well, let's see if I get done too fast. And, the hard part about this is she's got a recorder going, right? <laughs> if I get done too fast, the recording might not be good, and then I'll get in trouble. <laughs> okay, when should it be used? It's useful right after. This is the kind of intervention that you do in the field. You do it at the shelter. You do it at the church. You do it at the relief centers. You do it right after. This is not something that you use 12 months later. This is something that you use in the, in the weeks immediately following the intervention, and actually probably the days, which is why I'm encouraging you to think about training yourself now so that you're ready um, and you don't have to do the training like the day of a tornado kind of thing. It might be, um, it, it, there's, you could use this intervention, you can see that it's talking about using it after a house fire. So if you're a Red Cross volunteer who responds to house fires, this is a useful intervention for you. Um, in a tornado, you might be doing it up to a week or more following that tornado. And in an earthquake, it, and that's actually one of the reasons I did this training in China. I was in um, Western China, and you might remember that there's a very earthquake prone area on that side of that country and the social workers that I was training had been doing earthquake response. They've been doing disaster response post earthquake. And this is the kind of thing that one, if there's an earthquake, those people don't just scatter everywhere because everything's kind of down. Um, the tornado went through our city, but it was only a swath like a mile wide. Earthquakes level. And so the recovery takes a lot more time. And you might be doing this intervention in a longer term under those kinds of circumstances. It can be used, again, shelters, field hospitals, medical triage areas, emergency operation centers, crisis hotlines, disaster assistance centers, anywhere that you can think of where people who might go to after they're affected. Um, and certainly, there was lots of people affected in Tuscaloosa and we were dealing with people all over the city in different kinds of venues um, using this particular intervention. I really, I guess maybe you can hear that I believe in it, maybe because I used it um, and it, it was helpful and it was not stress inducing for me because like I was affected by the tornado as well. Um, in fact, it probably was useful to be able to deliver it. One of the things that we're gonna see in the components is actually helping others helps ourselves. 
Um, and so delivering this kind of intervention actually probably was useful to me, even if no one did it on me, right? Just doing it myself was also helpful. It includes basic information techniques for rapid assessment. So that's one of the things that the training will help you do, is kind of come up to know how to do a very fast assessment to triage, are you gonna be able to do something to help this person? Do you need to get some additional help in? Do you need to refer them on for some additional help? It relies on field-tested evidence-informed strategies that are useful in diverse settings, diverse events. It emphasizes developmentally and culturally appropriate intervention. So as I said, as you do the training, it will tell you how to deal with different types of populations under differing circumstances. And my favorite, it includes handouts, <laughs> right? I, you did, what did I come in here with? Handouts. Um, people like handouts. I've come, I was doing the copies of this, of this yesterday or the day before, and I was talking to a colleague, and I said, they may never look at this handout, but they like handouts. They'll, they'll positively evaluate the training if we give them handouts. <laughs> That's just the way we like taking stuff. Well, this intervention has that. So you can send handouts home with parents. Here, this is how you can help your child. You can send handouts home with other professionals. It's very, uh, maybe that's another reason I like this intervention. It's practical. I'm a very practical kind of person. I like stuff that has steps, that tells me what to do. That's just how I am. I'm a pragmatic kind of person. Okay, basic objective. <coughs> How much more basic can you get? Establish a human connection in a non-intrusive, compassionate manner. One of the things that we learned, that I learned post-tornado, is that not everybody wanted a human connection. Some people did. So you had to kind of use your gut to know, is this a person that I should kind of hang with a little while if I just sit with them? Maybe I'll connect with them even though they're not, they, at first they might not look like they want to connect with me. Just kind of hang around. One of the things I did that I thought was really a good way to do it, I, I was at temporary emergency services helping people get stuff. So I would, I don't know if any of you did any volunteer work there, but they had all kinds of stuff. They had clothing, cleaning supplies, baby supplies, sheets, blankets, pillows, and so people would come in with their list, and then one of us would walk them around, getting the stuff from their list, helping them find the sizes that they needed in the clothing, and so on. And in that, you began to kind of just connect with people, because you were giving them stuff. You were helping them find stuff. And that enabled me to kind of be non-intrusive in making that connection with people, just kind of hanging with them looking for the gene sizes, right, or finding, the, I'm telling, you know, temporary emergency services needs donations of new bras and underwear. I'm just saying. They get a lot of used stuff, but I spent a lot of time going through bras and underwear with people. You connect with people when you're looking for underwear. <laughs> what can I say? But they, that, that taught me they really need that new stuff. People don't want used stuff for that. You know, they want new stuff. Um, and so we didn't have much, and then we had to do a lot of looking, and they had them, they had them in drawers, and so I hung around with people and really just tried to help them, and then that enabled me to do this <coughs> intervention without them even knowing I was doing something officially as, a, as an intervention. You're looking to enhance immediate and ongoing safety and provide physical and emotional comfort. So uh, this is also, again, good why in the shelter you can carry water around with you and just share water with people and just kind of hang out with them or, what, what you're, or, or carry some snacks around. Um, they gave us snacks to give out to people, and that's another way to make that connection and just check and see how people are. This connection is actually one of the most crucial parts of the intervention, is simply connecting with other humans. I didn't understand it when I first learned about this, but since then I've read the stuff that, that Funda talked about today on the vagal nerve. There's a book and some videos, if you want to learn more about that, called The Polyvagal Theory. And the vagal nerve does lots of stuff. It's a huge nerve in your body. Sometimes people will know it because if you've ever fainted, sometimes it's because your vagal nerve was responsive to something. Um, the guy who fell over, from the snake, 
That was the action of his vagal nerve, was it, it transmits the information quickly so that you can do what you need to do to survive. But the other thing it does is it interacts, it's the social connection, it's what facilitates the social connection. So one of the, there are some of you here who are smiling and nodding at me. And as a presenter, when you smile and nod at me, that's kind of a connection with my, literally my vagal nerve. And it enables me to feel connected to you. And that makes my presenting better. I, I'll can, an undergraduate class at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no vagal nerve stimulation whatsoever. That bring donuts. Yeah, maybe that will do it, right? Um, I'm just, it's, that vagal nerve is crucial to, what, to our functioning as humans. And that's what you're invoking. That's the explanation for why this part of the intervention works. It, it's literally a neuroscience kind of intervention. Um, that, that social stuff, humans need that. We are a social species. We survive together. Anybody, what's the name of that movie with Tom Hanks? Where he was a, he was a the delivery person or something, and he crashed, and he was in an island. Yeah, Casper. And, he, and he, what did he do with the ball? He turned it into a face. That was his vagal nerve starving for human connection. We don't do well on our own. This intervention capitalizes on that. It encourages you to connect with someone, to engage them in a social, in that social interaction that is so crucial to human healing. <coughs> that that particular scene when he's like holding that ball, is it a basketball or a volleyball? Wilson. Volleyball. Wilson. Wilson. Oh my yeah. goodness! Even named. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> I would see it for a while. Never forget. Ball. Ball. Never forget. Ball. <laughs> So your idea here is to calm and orient emotionally overwhelmed or distraught survivors. Um, one of the, uh, any of you, are, I know we got social work person, social work person, social work. There's a woman in our um, department, her name is Lynn Tavola. She's a librarian. Her house was a direct hit. It was flat. She was disoriented for a while. She has a picture of herself standing up out of the wreckage of, of her house. It Literally, the house was flat. Um, she needed that orienting, literally. Her neighborhood was gone. Her house was gone. So literally, she needed orientation. People couldn't find their way around the city, if you remember, because the, 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 the signs were gone. Everything, the houses were gone, the landmarks were gone. This issue of calming and orienting is crucial to post-disaster survival. So the breathing that Funda talked about today, the activity, the dancing, I thought, to, like, wouldn't it be great in the shelters if you had an area where there was some dancing going on? Just, you know, maybe only the kids would show up at first, but it's healthy, it's calming. It's what kind of gets you back oriented to this social interaction, to the energy of being with people and being in touch with yourself, knowing that you're okay. Offering practical assistance. That's why those snacks were so important. That's why the water was so important. Anybody else remember the mountains of water on the sides of the road? There was water everywhere. Literally part of this kind of intervention. Just helping people have the practical things they needed, the diapers that they needed, um, the clothing that they needed. That practical assistance, very much a part of this particular intervention. That's why temporary emergency services was such a great place to be, because you could engage with this intervention in a really natural way, and we had a lot of stuff to give away. I mean, there was a lot of stuff. Sorting the stuff, sizing the stuff. I never knew there were that many sizes of jeans that were available. <laughs> until I saw the mountains that had to be sorted at temporary emergency services. You want to work to connect survivors to social support networks. One of the things that I'm really loving lately, now I know Facebook's done a lot of crappy stuff, <laughs> but that new check-in feature they have post-disaster, um, around the world, out of all of the technology that's available, most of the globe has cell phones. Those, those, those check-ins, 
to be able to find where your relatives are, that's like crucial. The Red Cross puts a great deal of effort into connecting people with their people. And that's why. This is, this is the step to it. So as a at post-disaster, when you're doing this kind of intervention, be prepared to help people find their people, find their kids, find, you know, if your kid was at school that day and you weren't with them, you wanted to find your kid and you wanted to find them fast. That's really, really important, getting those social networks back together. Support the coping efforts of the people who, the, so, at the beginning of this, I said there was nothing better for helping me than helping others. It's not just me. That's true about everyone. So if people are helping others, support them in helping others. Support them in the adaptive coping that they're already doing. Um, I, think, I think there's something in the Bible about fishing, right? <laughs> Giving a fish and teaching a fish, teaching to fish. That's essentially, that's the metaphor that also works here. If you, they are doing things that already are helping them cope, then that's what you help them to continue to do. Information. Um, I remember not the, tor not the big tornado this last time, but another tornado earlier where I was at a shelter on the university campus. I was in the rec center trying to get accurate information. Post-disaster, accurate information is like gold. Right? And so getting people accurate information is a, is a very important part of this intervention. Um, it's what helps people cope psychologically is knowing. One of the worst things for humans is not knowing. We don't do well with not knowing what's going to happen. If you can give people information so that they have a, at least a feeling that they might know what's going to happen next, and if you're in a shelter, what time is dinner going to be served? What time is lights out? When are the phones going to be available? When can you get you a washing machine? That kind of information is crucial and actually is a mental health intervention. It's part of this intervention, being able to tell people what they need um, so that they can cope psychologically. The other thing is to be clear about your own availability. If you're doing this, you know, it's real tempting. You're, you, you link with a human, you're at temporary emergency services, you really want to be able to help this person again. It's very important to say, no, I'm probably not going to be the person you're going to see next week. I want you to come to this particular place. There'll be mental health people here that can help you, or there'll be relief workers here that can help you. You don't want to overpromise because that can add to the problems um, already. So be clear on your availability and link people to other systems for longer term survival. So what, do you, what kind of skills and attributes do you think people need for this? Social skills. Social skills. What does that mean? Being able to connect. Yeah, being able to connect. I'm the kind of person that I must look like I'm, I want to communicate because people just ask me for directions in stores. <laughs> they'll, they'll be like, do you know where this is? I'm like, what do I look like? Do I have the Walmart thing on? Right? <laughs> But I think that I'll talk to anybody. I and that gets me in trouble. My husband's like, can you please shut up? <laughs> you know, stop talking to everybody. But I think talking to someone, being easy to talk to, is probably one of the skills. The ability to hear what they need, to listen, and they might not be emotional. They might have some, they might be a practical person. And to be able to hear what they're saying. Yes. The listening skills crucial because they may not even be able to tell you. So you might even have to listen between the lines. Which leads maybe observation. So those observation skills are crucial. Being able to notice if they're if you getting if you're any, getting eye contact or not getting eye contact. Or if they're looking all around and trying to figure out what do they need just from their nonverbals. So observation skills Listening skills, communication skills. What else? I feel like the deduction, that's what you're saying. Being able to deduce. Yeah, so what some, some, some thinking skills. Right I heard something else. Empathy. Empathy. Mm -hmm. um, Funda talked about the empathy, this, the, the, how it's kind of like it's our gift as humans. The gift to use in this circumstances is truly the gift. I spent 
I spent the beginning of my career working on a suicide crisis intervention hotline, a telephone. Now, you can see I'm not young. So when I was doing this, it was literally just the telephone. To, get, to even find someone took an act of Congress. Tracing a call was not easy. So, and we couldn't, they weren't sitting in front of us, so we had a lot of training on just listening, on just hearing, on empathy. A lot of times as a crisis intervention counselor, you can't really do much. All you actually can do is listen. And that turns out to be one of the most powerful interventions that we can offer. So I got convinced of it early, but I'm not sure that youngsters actually believe that. I'm not sure that they actually believe that just listening. And I, one of the reasons I don't believe it is because I've been training young social workers and getting them to believe that they don't have to give something or at, all they need to do is hear that that's enough of a gift, that the empathy is actually the gift. So I think you guys, thank you, right on. Good listening skills, patient, that was where I thought, I'm not a patient person, it, was, it took a lot for me to be patient, but I've learned I'm a better than I have been. A caring attitude, approachable, culturally aware. You are, look, you are, y'all are good. Did you look ahead in the hand up? <laughs> no? <laughs> non judgmental, kind, committed, flexible, and that last one? Huge. Huge. Temporary emergency services was chaos. The city was chaos. You just kind of had to shut it out, be with the person right in front of you and do what you needed to do next. That ability to tolerate chaos. Actually, for me, it was a little, in a way, maybe that was the way I survived myself because I could go to temporary emergency services and shut everything out except for you, whoever was in front of me. Um, what I was able to kind of like, that was probably helpful to me too. It helped me shut the chaos out. So you also need to engage in a profession. I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to go out and just kind of you know, go rogue. <laughs> Do it within an organized framework. Operate within the authorized response. Um, volunteer for the Red Cross and get yourself called up as a Red Cross volunteer. Um, after that disaster, their calls went out. Who wants to volunteer? Sign up here kind of thing but operate within authorized responses. And one of the benefits of that, if you do that, is you can get access to stuff, but maybe more importantly, you get access to accurate information. If you're locked into an authorized um, organization, then you're not passing along just any rumor, you're passing along informed rumors, because that's <laughs> kind of what it turned out to be some of the time. Um, you're working to model healthy responses um, yourself, you're working to be visible and available. So sometimes in a Red Cross shelter, you know, you just kind of, I did disaster mental health for them. They give you the badge, right, or the t-shirt, and you just kind of walk around. They called it, when they trained me, schmoozing. Anybody get that Red Cross disaster mental health training? So just kind of walk around, be available. Show that, so if they don't, someone might not want to talk to you in front of their family, but if they see you someplace else later, they might say, hey, I want to chat for a few seconds. This is what's happening. Maintain confidentiality. You know, just because you're not filling it out with a lot of paperwork doesn't mean this isn't real professional practice. It is. Practice within your scope of roles and abilities. So, if, you know, if, you're, if you have someone and it looks like they need more than what you can offer, make sure you find someone else to do what needs to be done. Stay aware of culture. That's hard to do when you're trying to operate in an environment like that, but it's important to try. Um, and then maybe what the flight attendant says to you when she's demonstrating the air masks, what does she say to you? Put the mask on yourself. That's maybe one of the most important things, is take care of yourself so that you can go back. I knew during that post-tornado period when I needed not to go to temporary emergency services. I needed to sleep or take care of my husband or do what we needed to do around the house. 
it was it's important to not and it was hard I mean I'm gonna I'm a human I'm like oh I feel bad I should be going to temporary emergency I said I was gonna go I should but I guess as I got older, I'm getting a little better at it. Not wonderful, but a little bit better at it. Politely observe, don't intrude. Ask with respect how you may help. Best way to make contact is to offer practical assistance. I love being at temporary emergency services. It was so easy, because I'm like, look, I've got cleaning products. I've got snacks. What do you need? I've got it. Um, that was just an easy way to do it. Um, be prepared for avoidance or a flood of contact, depending on where you are. Shelters, both of those things can happen if you're working a shelter. And then speak calmly, patiently, and sensitively. Um, I'm not very good at that all the time, but I keep trying. Speak slowly in simple everyday language. I'm. I am terrible about using vocabulary words that my friends um, actually call me nerd often or geek because I use vocabulary that, and, the, and it, so it's, this one's hard for me, but it's important to avoid jargon. Um, you, don't, you don't need to be saying, you have PTSD. Mm, no, you just kind of like, looks like you're having a little bit of a rough time today, what's going on? Um, stay out of the professional jargon stuff, no diagnosing that and so on. What survivors want to do is when they want to talk, just listen. Those of you who are kind of like me might find that more difficult because you want to talk. You want to, somebody, what, what, I don't know, well, maybe y'all are not like me because not very many people are. But people, when they say they, when they, when they bring a problem to me, I want to solve it. I want to be the one who solves it. So learning to keep my mouth shut and just listen so the person can solve the problem themselves has been a lifelong kind of professional struggle for me. Give accurate information and be prepared to repeat. Um, even in the best of circumstances, humans don't listen very well. Um, this morning we had the breakout sessions in the program. We had them on the overhead, but people still were asking where were the breakout sessions. And we weren't in a disaster. <laughs> After a disaster, a lot of repeating needs to go on. People need to be reassured, and they also know that rumors go around. So they might ask five people the same question to see if they get the same answer from five people, because if you get it from five people, maybe it's more accurate. If you're having to use a translator, you don't look at the translator, you look at the person that's talking to you. I don't know how many of you have had that experience of working with a translator. It's not easy to do. You want to look at the person who's talking because that's kind of the natural human response, but you need to be looking at the person who you're supposed to be communicating with and just kind of hearing. The tran people who do translation will know that, that you're not going to be paying attention to them if they are used to doing it. Remember the goals. Reduce stress assist with current needs, promote adaptive functioning, and this is a big one. Your job is not to elicit details of trauma and losses. That's totally not your job. Now, if someone is telling you stuff, listen. But it's not your job to say what happened, who did you lose, what was it like. Those questions are not part of this intervention at all. And in fact, there's a little bit of research that I am aware of that says some of that um, some of the critical stress debriefing stuff, if it's not done right, can actually have long-term harm. It can actually increase rates of PTSD. So don't be asking a lot of questions about the gory details. That's not what this intervention is about. Don't assume others' experiences. Just because I was in the tornado doesn't mean your experience was the same. Everybody's different. Everybody brings their own coping capacities. Don't assume traumatization. In general, most people will have had some level of traumatic stress, but you know, if you do emergency responding for a living, it might not, you might not have had any kind of, you're used to coping under those circumstances. And so you've seen far worse. This was like nothing for you, right? So assuming traumatization is just not necessary. Don't pathologize, because often people, um, they bounce back. That's, 
Humans are built to bounce back from trauma. Is there anyone in this room who hasn't faced a trauma in their life? At least a car accident, loss of a friend, leaving people behind and moving to a new place. That's traumatic in itself. Almost everybody has faced a trauma. Humans are built for it. We're evolutionarily prepared to bounce back from a trauma. So if you're pathologizing, you're kind of not giving that person respect and credit for what they probably can do on their own. Don't patronize or talk down to. This is tough to do sometimes, especially with little kids. Um, it's, it's easy to talk down to little kids, but under these circumstances, being respectful and talking with children rather than at children is crucial. Um, don't debrief. Don't assume everyone wants to talk to you. Don't speculate or offer inaccurate information. It's way better to say, I don't know, I'll try and find out, than to guess. Every time a person who's traumatized gets inaccurate information, it has the potential to lessen their trust in, in future helpers. Working with children and adolescents, you're talking at eye level which is getting harder for me, because when they're short, getting up again for me is hard. Um, help younger children verbalize using simple words for emotional reaction. Avoid extreme words. I have a husband who uses disaster language under like the best of, he'll, he'll talk about, he ripped his muscle when he swung a golf. I'm like, you didn't rip your muscle. <laughs> so I kind of got used to that, avoiding the disastrous language. Check back for clear understanding. So ask people if, what, they, what they think you said or what they think you're trying to get at. Talk to adolescents, adult to adult. Reinforce those techniques with parents to, give them a, to help them give appropriate emotional support to their children. Remember, I started the presentation by talking about if you ha can't help parents in communities, you're definitely not helping children. Well, the reason for that is you don't, even under the best of circumstances, if you're a teacher, you might have them for four or six hours. They're still going home, right? You're spending a lot of time. Their parents are the ones who need to be helping them. So helping parents helps children. When you're working with older adults, respect their strengths. As I'm getting older, I'm getting more and more aware of how important that is, because I'm realizing it's applying to me. Um, speak clearly and in a low pitch because of hearing problems. Older people lose higher pitch hearing first. Don't assume competency troubles based on appearance. Just because someone looks disheveled doesn't mean their brain's disheveled. Stay alert with the, for those with possible pre-existing mental health troubles. And you know, this is the path that professionals learn to walk, that kind of that kind of tender patient path between respecting that someone's abilities are intact, but checking to see if they truly are intact. You need to do that with respect, discretion, graciousness. And for survivors with disabilities, maintain respect. Try to find a place with less noise and less distraction. Address the person directly as opposed to talking only to their caregiver or their care partner. For those with communication trouble, you're trying to speak slowly, clearly. If someone says they have a disability, believe them, even if you can't see it. Enable self-sufficiency when possible. That's that fish metaphor thing. Um, uh, Offer your arm to a visually impaired person. Don't steer them. I don't know how many of you ever worked with visually impaired people, but they don't like to be steered. They want to just hold on to you and follow shoulder, elbow, um, whatever is comfortable for them. Write down information for people with hearing impairment. So it's always, I went to my temporary emergency services volunteer gigs. I know I looked terrible, but I had a fanny pack that was packed with paper, pen, you know, cough drops, whatever. And so I always had paper to be able to write what I needed to write. Hello, Dr. Gannon. Welcome. So core actions, just to repeat, contact and engagement. Your goal is to respond to contacts initiated by survivors or to initiate contacts in a non-intrusive, compassionate and helpful manner. Safety and comfort, to enhance immediate and ongoing safety, provide physical and emotional, and stabilization. Now is that a hard intervention, right? It's like connect with people, give them stuff, and help them calm down. <laughs> There's a man 
manual that's real big, and then there's six hours of training. But it's really not that complicated. I still am encouraging you, because you can get those free CDs, <coughs> right, to do the training. And there's more, a little bit more to it than when I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying it for you, but I'm, I guess I'm doing that because I want to encourage you to seek the training. Information gathering is around current needs and concerns. Um, you're trying to figure out what, like any other mental health intervention, figure out what's going on and what they need. So, so you're offering what they need, what, not what you think they need. Right? There's a look, there's a difference there. Practical assistance, offer practical help in addressing immediate needs. You know, this isn't about doing therapy. Therapy is for weeks later. This is about helping people maintain equilibrium in the moment. And if they need a roof over their head, then help them find someone who can help them find a roof over their head, or a blanket, or diapers, or food, or whatever it is. That's actually the crucial stuff that needs to happen. And then connecting with social supports. Information on coping. Some of the handouts that you'll get when you do this training that are available for download have to do with techniques for people so that they can take the handouts home to the techniques that we talked about, some of the controlled breathing stuff, some of the things to do with their children to help them calm themselves to do that affect regulation. And then I walked around a lot with the, like a handout. They made us these little handouts so we could just hand people. Here's, here's a sheet with the number for the Red Cross, FEMA, you know, all of the information numbers that people need right after that. You think you're going to have immediately available, but usually it's folks like us who have to get those photocopies made and hand them out. The basic objective is early, is this, if this is early assistance within days or own or even weeks. This isn't something we're going to do for the tornado that happened a year ago. Providers have to be flexible and use your judgment on which, you know, it might take you a second to connect with someone or it might take you 20 minutes to connect with someone depending on who they are. There's, um, I gave you this, I put the full link for this in here because I wanted you, because I gave you the handout, I thought if you had the link it will take you to the VA site for psychological first aid. And on this page is the mobile app that you can download. Don't force people to share their stories with you. Give simple reassurances. Statements like those where you'll, everything will be okay, that stuff is, uh, when you're kind of really upset and someone says to you, everything's going to be okay, do you believe them? No. No. Your house is flat. Everything's not going to be okay. So those, those, um, those reassurance, I think they can diminish calm. So doing that, this is like the don't do that because the, it's trite. It decreases kind of the level of effect on of how this disaster affected their lives, um, and it's not helpful. Might actually agitate someone. Don't tell people what you think they should be feeling. Don't tell people why you think they have suffered by giving reasons about their personal behaviors or beliefs. This all just applies to regular life. Too. Yeah, this all applies to pretty much regular life, but it may be more crucial post-disaster, right? Don't make promises that may not be kept. Don't criticize existing services or relief activities in front of people who need them. You know it happens. <laughs> by learning, you will teach. By teaching, you will learn. So I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is you get this training. The way I learned this stuff the best was telling other people about it. So I'm going to encourage you to do that yourselves. This workshop's only a first step. Please do the online training. Talk to others about what you've learned. And thank you for helping me improve my learning and reminding me of what this was about, because I had forgotten. It was a few years since I used it. I'm on time. <laughs>